tonight. Give him a prize. Hey. If you know he's able. Yeah. Everybody say, oh. Good morning, church. It's good to see you guys. Um, something we do here at Disciple City Church is a call and response to start our service. So if you know it, you can respond. Uh, I was glad when they said unto me. Well, let's do it one more time. I was glad when they said unto me.
If you said it, we believe it. Good morning, family. How are we doing? We doing all right? Well, this is a wonderful time that we get to take communion. So if anybody that doesn't have the elements, you can go back there and grab them.
Well, I really today just want to read God's word over you as we talk about communion. And I just wanted to let you hear his love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, reads this. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took the bread and he had given thanks. He broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so honestly, y'all, I just hope this week y'all just read over that scripture and just think and meditate on his love for me and for you. Uh, and that love is a sacrifice. And so I pray that you would think about that this week. Meditate on it. 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 And then pray that God would show you how to show the love of Jesus to somebody this week. Amen? And that's not just to y'all to y'all who are here, but for you who are listening online. May you do that as well. So we have the elements today. And so we have the body. And this is representative of his body broken for us. Let's take this in remembrance of our Savior. This cup also represents his blood shed for us for the remission of our sins. Let us drink. Man, just remember that this week, God's goodness through this thing of communion.
just so thankful, Lord, that uh, we could come to you today as we are, Lord. God, I can't, can't even count the number of times that you've had to pick up my pieces, the pieces of my family, the pieces of my ancestors. God, time and time again, Lord, you have shown that you are faithful, God. You have shown that you are a defender, a protector, Lord. God, and I, I, and I ask, God, for myself, for my family, uh, and for my family here at DCC, Lord, that we would take the time to confess. God, that we would take the time to just go before you, to admit that we are man, God, but to remember that you are God, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, Lord. And when it seems hopeless, Lord, will we remember that you bring back the head of our enemies, Lord. You have already won the victory, Lord. I pray that we would just sit in that, that we would celebrate that, Lord. I pray that in my life because it's easy to forget, Lord. It's easy to be overwhelmed by the things of this earth, God. It's easy to be focused and to love the things of the world, Lord. But when we sit back and we remember that you are the defender, that you are the provider, that you are the giver, the joy and peace, oh my gosh, Lord. Lord, would you do that for us today, God? God, thank you for your word that is living and breathing. God, we are just so thankful that we don't have to guess what it is that you're saying, Lord, but that you've given us the word right here. Amen. We're going to read out of Job chapter 42. And the word goes like this. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliaph, the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. 
Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So Eliaph the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them. And the Lord accepted Job's prayer. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginnings. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first daughter uh, Jemima, and the name of his second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapuch. And in all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. Amen. You may be seated. The word of God for the people of God. Everybody say, thanks be to God. Amen. We uh, want to do an exercise here. Everybody do me a favor. and Pull out your phone. Hold it up. Hold it high. Show me. Your phone. I I got a question. Hold that up. I want you to feel a little burn in your shoulder. All right, hold this up for just a second. I want you to tell me something about these phones. Hold it up. Don't go. Don't go tired on me. Don't quit on me. Hold that thing up. This phone that you're holding up, if it has access to the internet, continue to hold it up. All right. If you use it as a source for your news, sports news political news, economy, any type, world news, anything, hold it up, okay? If it is a way that you read a timeline or a book or do any sort of research, continue to hold it up, hold it up. I've seen some people like, man, look, I'm tired of this already. All right, if if this is something that you use more than a desktop, not a laptop, but a desktop computer, continue to hold it up. Some people went down. Okay, some of y'all still use a traditional desktop. I'm proud of you. If you use this more than you use your laptop, I'm, now I'm, I'm curious. Keep holding it up. If you use a laptop more, put your arm down. If, if your arm is, is, is tired and you feel like this is pointless, go ahead and put your arm down. Go ahead and put your arm down. Everybody, look at some of y'all are like, this has got a point. He didn't do this for nothing. Look at y'all. Y'all believe in me. All right, put your arms down. All right. A slight exercise because uh, literally an exercise. Some of y'all are going to be sore tomorrow. Drink your water, all right? Just release some of that lactic acid or whatever it is. You can ask Jorge. He read scripture. He can also tell you about your muscles. Uh, More than I got. I don't know. He's got more than I got. So uh, I bring this up, this phone, because we live in... A very interesting time. All right, you remember kind of this uh, industrial revolution maybe about a century ago. I mean, a little longer than that, but everything went industrial. Factory manufacturing, things were produced in, in mad quickness. We now live in a technological revolution where we have technology like crazy. And what technology has brought to us is in some ways efficiency But it's brought some other things, and one of them is information. Say information. Nope, say information. There you go. We live in the information age. You can know anything you want to know 
within a matter of seconds. If we had more time, I would tell you to pull up Google, and I would tell you to type something in, the first thing that came to your mind, and hit search. And then I would want you to find that little thing at the bottom where it's like, pulled up this many results in this amount of time. Maybe this is homework. Go and do that. It is, oh my gosh, it's unbelievable. We have access to more information than anyone, any other time in history, at our fingertips, in our pockets, at every moment. That is a ridiculous amount of power. But I would say that maybe the power that it has hasn't necessarily translated all the way down to getting walked out in our lives. I'll give you an example. I hold in my hand, and I'm going to hold it up. I'm going to continue my little shoulder work out here. Something that you may be familiar with. I would venture to bet that you have been given one of these before in your life, that you've taken it home with you, and maybe it was used, maybe it was lost. Maybe it's still somewhere in the recesses of a closet in your bathroom or beneath your sink or you gave it away. I don't know. Do you know what this is? Oh, man, come on, somebody. Say it a little louder. Do you know what this is? This is dental floss. I'll hold something else. Maybe you can recognize this. I know some of y'all are far away. I get it, all right? Do you recognize this? This little placard. This is like floss 2.0, right? This is the best. It's like you don't need a toothpick or floss. You need a placard. You get both in one. Uh, you pay for it, though. Anyways, but dental floss. How many of you know the benefits of flossing? Are there any saints among the people of God who are well acquainted with the benefits of flossing? You know about flossing. Anybody, anybody know about flossing? Is there anyone in here who's like, never heard of it? Anybody, never heard of flossing? Okay, all right. I'm not talking about the little dance. I'm not going to do it, all right? That's I'm talking about dental floss. Now, everybody do me a favor. Use the other arm this time. I want you to hold your hand up if you know about flossing. Arms all the way up. If you didn't put deodorant on, don't worry about it. I'm not, I'm not pointing the elbows. I know somebody. All right, I'm just kidding. So if you know about dental floss, hold your arms up, okay? We're going to operate on a lot of trust here. If you floss every day, every day, put your hand down. Hey, you don't have to feel sad that you have good dental hygiene, all right? If you floss every day, put your hand down. If you floss multiple times a week, put your hand down. All right, all right, I see you. If you floss multiple times a month, maybe, put your hand down. If you're like, look, bro, I flossed before, put your hand down. All right, I, after that, it just kind of falls off. Listen, if you're in the camp of like, the dentist told me that I need to floss. So I flossed like three times since years ago. You, look, you have access to information. Is that information being applied? Use floss as a, as a, as a representation. Because here's what I know. How many of you have ever felt the extreme pain of something being wrong with your teeth. Anyone? Has anyone felt that? The worst pain I ever felt, it wasn't because of flossing. I had my wisdom teeth removed, and my, my, my meds wore off, and I just stood, this grown 18-year-old, like I'm hard, screaming, crying, bleeding, spitting into the sink with my mom in the hallway like, <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'm, just go I'm here with you, man. This looks like it's terrible. Teeth will bring you a pain that can be incomparable, just far and above worse than many things. And yet we know that flossing can save us from a world of pain. It's just hard to really put that information into practice. we got so much information to put into practice. The information age has power, but does that power get lived out? Pastor Jerry would say that pain will teach you what wisdom can't. And today I use floss as a kind of lighthearted thing to bring an end to our time in Job. Here's a, here's a, a, a 
kind of like a truth that I would like to say, and then I kind of want to poke a little bit. Pain has a way of taking information and internalizing it in us in a way that scrolling, seeing, reading, studying, schooling, none of that can really do for us. There are really two ways that information grows legs in our lives, and it's through repetition and hardship. So here's a question that I want to pose to you. I am going to to take a guess that you are well-educated when it comes to things about God. You are pretty familiar with the scriptures. You probably know a couple off top. You could probably... I call out a reference and you find it. Some Bible quiz champions in here. You might even be confident enough to like facilitate a time of, of Bible study. Pick a passage. I could, we could probably navigate that, right? You could, you could probably hold it down. My question for you, though, is, is all of that information that you have stored up, those reserves... Is it getting put into practice? Now, I don't say this because I'm assuming that it isn't. There's no, there's no shameful assumption happening here. I just want to pose a question in order to really land the plane well on this book of Job. Is the information age benefiting your walk with God? Not your information about God, but your love for him. Your relationship with him. Here's the question that I really want to ask today. How do I move from information about God to intimacy with God? How do I move from information about God to intimacy with God? We've been looking through the book of Job. And Job makes something pretty clear for us and that one of the only ways to become well acquainted with this information that we know about God is to internalize it during suffering. Lighthearted sermon today. Job. We're going to be in chapter 42. It was read, and here's kind of a, a preview of what we're going to do, all right? As we kind of look at this question... Here's how we're going to handle it today. Move from information about God to intimacy with God by, might seem a little bit redundant, knowing God, knowing your identity, knowing who you are, knowing your calling, and knowing the suffering servant. I'm not throwing any shade at information, age, or knowledge because you need it. I just want to know, how do we get that walked out, applied? How do you move from knowing about God to knowing God? So, first point, move from information about God to intimacy with God by knowing God. Again, it's going to be a little bit redundant, but I want to look at these first couple of verses real quick and make a point with Job's response. If you'll recall, Michael preached last week on like 135 verses. If you see Michael just like, you marathoned it, man. Good job. That was like a, sorry. I apologize for that imagery. Anyways, all right. We've all maybe, anyways, we're just gonna keep pushing. All right, so he did that. God is responding to Job. And what does Job say to God? Verse 42, or verse one in chapter 42, it says, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know. Say, I know. Say, I know. I know. Now, this word has a a pretty wide range of meaning, okay? You can know something based on hearing about it, word of mouth type thing. Someone's experienced secondhand stuff, passed down, scroll through a timeline, you you see some sort of a a headline, and you kind of just keep going. You can know something like that. Or there is a kind of knowledge that leads to childbirth, Hebrew has a a wide range of knowing. Adam did know Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to a son. All right, so knowing has a wide range. What is Job saying with this word here? He uses the term 
to assert the depth of his knowledge about God. But I think that you would be in agreement with me by saying, something tells me he's not just saying like, man, I read this book, and it was like so uh, uh, intellectually stimulating. Like, I know God because of what I've heard about him. No. He says, this is deep. This is rooted. And his suffering isn't anything that he's grateful for, but he's recognizing that it brought him something invaluable, this deep knowledge of God. And there are at least four references in these first six verses to this idea of of knowing, this idea of knowledge. There are a few different ways that it's used, some synonyms. There's more than four, but at least four. And the repetition is intentional. What does Job know? Read the rest of the verse. Verse 2, it says, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Now, again, Michael last week did a great job of unpacking all of what God had to say. God kind of presents himself in this way where he's sovereign. He's over everything. He's in control. He's kind of this... uh, um, axis around which everything is orbiting. He's central. And because of that, God's trustworthy. He presents himself as, yo, like you can lean on me. I'm able to see all of these things, understand them. I created them, Job. I see the the disorder that you're experiencing. I bring order. Hold on to me. And in verse 3, Job quotes God back to God. Earlier in chapter 38, uh, God poses this question to Job. He says, Who is this that hides or darkens counsel without knowledge? God knew that there were things that Job didn't know at the time. And he put him on. And Job is here saying, you're right. I didn't know that. That's what he responds with. Therefore, I've uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. God didn't expect Job to see everything. Job had never been like on top of a cloud, seeing everything, looking down from this perspective much higher than his own. He'd never toured the cosmos, right? But God provided, revealed all of this stuff for Job. And Job recognized that, though his confusion in his situation and his suffering was warranted, even his frustration, valid. He'd questioned God because he didn't understand God's bigness, God's wisdom. And did you catch the last clause? Again, I did not know. Job poetically communicates a really clear point that we would probably use today. If I had known then what I know now. You ever said that before? Man, I would have changed a couple of things and that is what he's saying. But how would Job finish that sentence? Got to keep reading. He quotes God again in verse 4 when God twice said, I will question you and you make it known to me. Both times Job was like, hey, man, I'm just going to keep quiet. <laughs> I'm just, you got it. I'm going to let you handle this. But Job is now unveiling how he truly feels in response to God. He'd been silent, and now here he is giving a response. Verses 5 and 6, he says, I'd heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. He's saying, I have firsthand experience, not someone's secondhand information. This, this isn't just something that I am familiar with, that I've heard about. This is something that is deeply personal to me now. It's incredible. And he concluded, he said, Therefore, I despise myself and repent and dust and ashes. Now, this verse is interesting, okay? There, there's a couple things here that I want to point your attention to. It could, it could go a couple of different ways in the way that you read it, right? Someone taking the Hebrew that it's written in, translating it into English, those are huge jumps. I just want you to know, very different languages. And it could go a couple different ways. So that first clause, right, uh, Job says, therefore I despise myself. It doesn't actually have an object. There, Job says, I despise. There is no myself. There is no object. And so with that, people who have been studying this passage for a very long time, doing a lot of deep work, they have some, like, discrepancies. They kind of lean, they teeter 
They're on the fence about what Job is saying. Is he saying himself, which would be some form of like a repentance, not shame? Or is he like wanting to recant, correct the record? What's going on? Like, for example, other translations that you might read. Anybody read out of the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible? Yours, I see a couple hands. Yours might read, therefore, I reject my words and I'm sorry for them. Or the NASB. Anybody read the NASB? See a couple of hands. Here you go. It says, therefore, I retract. Or the NLT, the New Living Translation. Anybody? I know a couple of people who read that one. Here it says, I take back everything I said, which is really pushing that. That's a, they, they doubled down there. But here's what I would say. Job isn't taking back everything that he said. He's not regretting that he's grieving with God. But he's also not wallowing in shame. There is something that's happening here. What is it? He is saying that he would change some things about his approach. He's not mad that uh, my mom's mom, so my maternal grandmother, taught my mother who taught me the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Brittany Noel Sears hates when I say that. I don't know why. She just don't like it. Probably because it's weird. Also because I take liberties with it. I am a squeaky wheel. Sometimes I get grease. Anyways, but uh, Job is saying I would change my approach. He's grateful to have heard from God because now he knows God. He's not grateful that he suffered, but he's grateful for what came from his suffering. And he's saying, if there were some things that I could change in my approach during that time, I would do it. That's what I would side with. I'll give some more reasons for that. But uh, the second clause kind of helps me get there. Job said, and repent in dust and ashes. That word repent could have a double meaning. I know we're getting off in the weeds of the words, all right? But can we just like take a deep breath together? All right, let's keep it pushing. It could have a double meaning. One being to be sorry, to come to regret something. The other is to console oneself, to be comforted. And one commentator put it this way. He wrote, Job thus rejects or despises what he so recently said, for he now understands that God is his friend, not his enemy. So he is consoled and comforted, though still suffering. Okay, so hold that. The other note here about translation concerns this preposition. Remember, we're in the weeds. If you feel like, bro, it's been a while since I was in English class, I feel you. A preposition is like on, at, with, I went to the store with, preposition, someone, right, with, okay. That preposition is Job repenting in dust and ashes, in them. There's a guy, Dr. Samuel Ballantyne, who asserted that the specific verb form that's used here with this preposition, I just want to tell you that there's like a formula that ends in a specific translation, because I think it's going to be helpful. Okay, this is what he said. That uh, pairing typically means to reconsider something or, more often, to put something out of mind, to forget all about it. So in this verse, that something is his dust and ashes. The preposition cannot be read as Job repenting with or in dust and ashes. Rather, he reconsiders his dust and ashes or puts them, has thereby announced the end to his mourning as he has accepted his new reality. Do you see how there's a pretty big distinction there? He's either despising himself and repenting in dust and ashes, which doesn't make sense with the rest of the narrative, granted time could pass, or he's saying, man, look, I know you now. There are some things that I would have changed if I could have gone back in time, but you've put me on, and I'm ready to, to move on to the next stage of my grieving. I've had this phase of grief You've met me in it, and it's time for me to get up and get back to work. Now, I'm not going to say that's what everybody needs to do. That would undo everything that we've talked about this summer. I'm saying that could be what's happening in this book right here in these verses, which might make more sense with where we go in the rest of this passage. That's where I would land. Option B. Job wasn't continuing to wallow in shame. He wasn't 
choosing to sit in more grief. That doesn't mean that he abandoned his grief or that he's now done with his grief. We all know that's not how grief works, right? Can we all agree? Grief isn't static like that. It doesn't stay in one moment of our lives. It kind of just like is a limp that you learn to, to function with, right? Sometimes the limp is more pronounced. Sometimes you would never know unless you knew. Similarly, Job is like, I'm ready to move on. He's never going to get his stuff back. He's never going to get his kids back. But he says, what I wanted most was to hear from God. Now, he may not have heard what he wanted to hear. We'll get to that. But he heard from God. And that consoled, comforted him, and moved him to a place where he was ready to keep it pushing. And in Michael's words from last week, he centered on God. He has now been decentered in his suffering, and he has centered on God. So Job moved from knowing about God, I'd heard of you with the hearing of the ear, to now knowing God in his suffering. I've seen you. Again, he didn't learn why this happened. He doesn't know why all of this stuff came about. But he does know it wasn't because of something that I did, which is what he was just on trial for, Right? What he did learn was that God was for him. Is there anything more comforting than knowing that the creator of all things, who's sovereign over all of history, and our little blip of a moment, <laughs> straight, blip, 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 if you know, you know, all right? Our little blip of a moment in the timeline of all that is, that that creator is for you. He's a friend to you. He cares for you. He wants good for you. Unbelievable, man. Last night I saw Thomas Roberts in person. Do you know who Thomas Roberts is? No, exactly. He came through the FC Dallas Academy. Just a normal guy. But I'm like, that dude's greatness. If he had been like, what's up, man, and dap me up, and it, I would have been like, oh, cloud nine. I'm like, this is, you're younger than me and remarkable. So incredible. I would have felt great. How much greater the God of heaven and earth condescends to you, cares for you, knows you by name, holds you down when you're too down to hold on to him. That is good news, incredible news. What a God we serve. And all of that knowledge that God was for him, that God is sovereign, that God is wise, all of that enabled Job to trust. And the same could be true for us. The same could be true for you. Suffering isn't good. Nowhere in Orthodox Christianity throughout the millennia has it ever been true that suffering is good. Suffering is not good. It wouldn't be suffering. The strength that our God has, though, is that no matter how evil the suffering, he has a way of bringing good from the situation. He doesn't turn the evil into good. Any of us who've been through suffering would say, yeah, 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 I'm never going to be cool with what happened to me. Insert whatever it might be. We may all agree, though, that there are some things that God in his infinite wisdom and kindness brought out of that that were like, man, I'm really grateful for this, though. Super silver lining, all right? Not the best. Wouldn't trade it necessarily, but that was pretty cool. I'm grateful for this. That just feels really important to me personally because there are, there are some proponents who have like misspoken or spoken a little bit carelessly and it leaves us in a moment where we wonder like, so am I just supposed to believe that the evil that came about was somehow good? No, 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 no. We can hold on to the fact that God will bring it into a history though and upon that, he will make, he will right every wrong. In what way? I cannot know. But that good news gives me something to hold on to. When hardship comes, it can be a catalyst for your faith. I want to provide a couple tips and keep moving. Here's one of them. How... Uh, you can know God, right? Move from information about him to intimacy with him. One of those tips is asking the right question, okay? 
Another exercise, if you will. How many of you have ever asked God, warming up here, why? Anybody? Why God? You might have said it in this way. Why me? Why did this happen? Why did you allow it? Now, I'm thinking that it might be a reflex of humanity. Just comes with the territory. You're a humanoid? All right. You ask why when bad things happen. I don't know. But for many of us, at least in our society, we definitely do this. All right? You guys have kind of proven that with me. All right? But I want to challenge us to learn to ask a potentially better question. Uh, Maybe you have received a why for a moment of suffering that you've endured. I don't know that I could say that I have any whys answered. What I do have answers to is how. Often, we don't know who God is because we're asking why, not how. It might sound like this. How do you want me to grow in this? How do you want to use me in this? How do you want to use this as it is? How are you shaping me? How are you teaching me? How are you working in this, that, the third person, rather than asking why, for which you will always attempt to derive meaning. There's a, Jen, I'm going to have to lean on you again for a second. There's a, there's a, 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 a theory or a practice, I'm getting the word wrong, of counseling. It's about like narrative or story, right? Meaning making through storytelling. Does that sound familiar? Nope. All right. That's because she has good practices. I only know the like not so good ones. So, but we all have this thing within us where we are trying to derive meaning at all times. We want to mean something. We want things to mean something. And in that, there are forms of counseling that will help us to tell stories in a way that that tell meaning, give us handles on things. I think that's why we ask why. I think it contributes to that. I want you to find meaning in a different place, at least attempt to. Ask how. It's not a silver bullet, but it's a tool to help us reframe our expectations. Because if God doesn't give us the answer to our question, we might think he doesn't care. But what if he has done all of this work and we've missed it because we didn't have our expectations framed correctly? And we've missed him and his goodness and his kindness. Here's another tip. i got to keep us moving. If you want to move from information to empathy, empathy, intimacy, wait for an answer in two different senses, time and habits. We often want God to provide an answer right now, right now. Can anybody be a witness that fast is better than slow? It's a, it's a principle in soccer. It's a principle in life. Uh, you tired of hearing about soccer yet? I'm sorry, it's a World Cup year. you got to get this work, okay? Uh, We often want God to provide this question right now. Reasoning for that is that our frenetic society has imprinted its hurry on us. It is internalized. We just can't help it. We also can't help that we want a drive-through window on God's wisdom. We don't even want to get out the car. We're on our way, and God is just another stop. Now, it's an overstatement, but hopefully it's a helpful illustration to have us thinking, are we waiting on God, or is God waiting on us while we get to the next destination? Just an added place to our final destination. Thank you, Google Maps, for that visual. Job waited for an answer. He sat in it. He didn't run away from it. He waited, and we would do well to follow his example both in time, but also waiting in our habits. Are you hearing God's words through Scripture? Are you listening for him in prayer, in silence, in solitude? Are you willing to fast, to forego food in order to feast on God? All of these disciplines can be extremely helpful And then not just personal stuff, but communal stuff. 
Have you invited your community into your situation to pray with you, to speak into it, to wait with you, to check in on you, to walk with you? Community is a discipline that just transcends your own efforts if you welcome it. And these can assist you in waiting for an answer from him. They're also formative. They help you to know God. They move you from information to intimacy. They may not be your answer, but they can help you to be shaped as you wait. And speaking of moving, Job moves on. We need to move on. Job moves on. He moves forward. He chooses to move to a new stage in his grief. And for some of us, God's giving us room. God's sat us down. He's invited us to inhabit a space like other sermons in this series. And you don't need to get up and do nothing. You stay right where you are. You sit and you wait and you grieve and you lament and you continue to do the hard work. The hard work of suffering. For others of us, we might be in a similar situation to Job. Where God has spoken where God has provided an answer, and he's saying it might be time to get up. It might be, di- be, it might be time to, to put off the dust and the ashes, which is a part of our next point. So first, move from information to intimacy about God. <laughs> Y'all going to have to pray for me. Move from information about God to intimacy with God by knowing God. The second piece there is by knowing you by knowing your identity, by knowing your calling. If you missed it, at the end of chapter 31, the narrator informed us that Job's words ended, that he was done with his speaking. But what we didn't know is whether or not Job passed the test. If you've been keeping up in chapter 1, Job endured some suffering. At the end of chapter 1 it said, and Job didn't sin with his lips in all that he endured. You get to chapter two, more suffering. The narrator says, Job didn't sin with his lips. Then there's this third test, right? Accusations from his friends for chapters and chapters and chapters and chapters and chapters. Job was going through it, and his words are ended, but we don't know. We're hanging. If you've been following this this plot line, you're like, so what's up? Is he good? Did he pass? Did he fail? What's going on? And God spoke. God responded, but I I still don't really know. And now we see Job here. Job responds, and he says he repents, but I don't don't know. Something just seems off. Is Job in the right? Is Job in the wrong? Did he pass or fail? What happened? And here we find our answer. If you've been following that, if you've been on the edge of your seat, I'm here to tell you, you're rewarded. It happens. We get our answer. But God didn't just tell Job. God spoke on Job's behalf to his accusers. God vindicated his servant. It's so cool, man. I love the Bible. This is dope. Look at verse 7. It says, after the Lord had spoken. Let me pause. Note some repetition if you can. See if you pick up on anything that's repeated here. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams, each of them, which is a huge sacrifice, go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. There were two things there that I wanted you to notice through the repetition. Did you catch them? Any, any guesses? I heard my servant four times. We'll get to that one. That's the second one. Anybody want to take a, a guess at the other? Bang, bang. We got some scholars in here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. First, you have not spoken of me what is right like Job has. There it is. There's the moment. moment. <laughs> Pray for me. Come on, God, help me. Uh, that's the moment that we've all been waiting for, that God told the friends that they were wrong. The friends had a wrong understanding of God. They expected that if you are suffering, you are a sinner. 
If you are blessed, you are obedient. That was their understanding, not just about a way that the world might function on occasion, but the way that God existed. That's all that's true of God. Only sinners suffer. So sufferers are sinners. Only the obedient are blessed. So blessed people must be obedient. That was their understanding of God. And the entirety of the time, Job was saying, I am suffering, I am also innocent. There's got to be some other way. And here we see God saying, you were wrong, friends. You were wrong. They hadn't held up what had been established. Another way that this word is used, it's like a, like a cosmological reference, like the moon established, the stars established, the way that the world works established. It's set up. You can see it all over the place. Similarly, God is like, I'm established, and you guys didn't say anything that, uh, that, that functions with reality, with facts, with the way that everything is established. And similarly, they didn't say what was true, what was trustworthy. There was a neighboring nation, and in the language of Akkadian, they had a similar term that even connoted this idea of justice. And that synonym is if to say, Job's friends didn't do God justice in the way that they spoke about him. God didn't just tell them that they were wrong. God also told the friends that Job had spoken rightly. And you're like, yes. It happened. You were holding out for, for the dude the whole time. My guy made it. You just, you're just celebratory. That's how I feel. I'm like, he got it. Let's go. He had ho- held on to this countercultural understanding of God. He had gone through all of this accusation, all of this suffering, and he said, you can suffer and not be experiencing God's judgment, God's punishment, God's discipline, and he endured the suffering without forfeiting his faithfulness, and God exonerated him, and we've hinted at this moment all summer, at least I've tried to give little nuggets, but like not give too much, but this is what happens, Job, he said that he would change some things about his approach, but he spoke rightly, his understanding of God wasn't off base. He doesn't need to be corrected in his theology. The revelation that Job had about God was proper. It was right. He wanted to exhibit more trust, more acknowledgement for God's godness, for his sovereignty, for his wisdom, etc. But he doesn't regret his honesty, and he shouldn't. He doesn't regret his lamenting, and he shouldn't. His expression of his emotion. God doesn't correct any of those things. He simply wishes that he had trusted a little bit more. But now he's ready to move forward. He's saying, I can't change my reaction in the past, but I'm ready to move forward. I'm ready to keep going in my process. I love that God didn't correct him. I love that Job is cool with what happened. It's good news. And it reiterates that God invites your lament, that he welcomes your emotion, that heaven holds space for your grief. It's good news. And let's get to that second repeated notion, that my servant Job. God called Job his servant, which is a term that was used for Abraham, for Moses, for David, for Elijah, and for others. We'll get to some others. And this isn't the first time that he called Job his servant. Oh, but that's the best. That is so good. Here's the truth. Job's suffering didn't change how God recognized him. It did not change his identity. It did not change his calling, which begs the question, what does God say about you? What does he say about you? Not what is your negative self-talk run through you all day long. It's not what do your friends say. It's not what is your context or your suffering or your failures. What does God say about you? What does he give you as an identity? What is the calling that he has provided you? It's one of the biggest things that I felt like God's pressed on me for this sermon. So if somebody needs it, God pressed it on me for you. Because I think that some of us carry this in our bodies, whether or not we're aware of it. I think that it's just 
there. I think that we are afraid that our hardship or our suffering, past, present, or future, might be something that the enemy uses to take us out. To change how God sees us or wants to use us. It might alter something about us. But the enemy could not touch Job's identity or his calling. Calling. Or Colin. Colin, if you're here, maybe it's for you. So listen. The adversary cannot take you out. The adversary cannot take you out. The adversary cannot take you out. Everybody, on three. One, two, three. The adversary cannot take you out. But here's the reality. He can fake you out. He is the best April Fool's joke teller of all time. His sleight of hand is unmatched. Pen and teller can't hold a candle to dude. You want to talk about identity theft. Dude's track record is immaculate. The problem is, you can't really steal someone's identity. You just borrow it. You use it for a time. You don't change who they are. He can get creative enough to make you think that you aren't who God has said you are. He can divert your attention to a lot of stuff, fix your attention on a lot of things that aren't God's voice, that aren't God's word, that aren't the truth. And he loves to feed you watered down, diluted truth. Still got a similar look, similar taste. Slowly moving you away until you've internalized lies about God and about yourself. He can fake you out. I want to pose a question, and it might not be for you. It might not be for everybody in here, but I wanted to pose this question. Has your suffering severed your serving? Now, this isn't some, like, you know, manicured attempt for me to get everybody to do something that I want you to do. I don't care. I don't care. I don't have things that I need people doing or else this place is going to fall apart. I got, that, there's a lot of things that are said about the church right now. A lot of them well-deserved. At Disciple City Church, your health matters way more to us than your help. Please hear me. If you're in a season where God has sat you down, don't get up. I don't care who tells you to get up. When Jesus said, take up your mat and walk, it was time for you to go. I'm not Jesus. I'm not telling anybody here to get up and walk. I do want to partner with him to pose a question potentially if there is anyone who does need to get up and walk, though. Is it possible that your suffering has upended you in such a way that you believe you'll never bounce back? Might be a question for your season. It might not. But it fits the scope of the book. I just want to pose it. Something else that fits the scope of this book, not just sitting in your season, but also stepping up and moving forward, is getting back to who God's made you. Not getting back to some task or some team, but to who God has made you, to your identity, to your calling, what God has invited you to participate with him in, how he's invited you to partner with him. If suffering has severed your serving, I want you to investigate your beliefs about your identity. I want you to check on the substance of your calling. Here's something beautiful. Usually, your hardship is like, it's like a chef who knows how to use their seasonings. It's coming from, from, from a white kid, okay? So I just want to say... Sometimes we don't, I don't know how to use my seasonings. I, we, it's not true of everyone. We just go, anyways, you get it. If you know, you know, right? 
But when someone knows how to use their seasonings, you taste it and you just, it just hits a little bit different, you know, and you're like, yeah, we're going to have to come back for this. <laughs> I just think about, uh, we say we're not like family, we are family, we run to tension, not from tension. We talk about reaching out across cultures. You can always tell uh, when the fish fry seasoning is right, uh, when everyone in the group says, this is good, not like, yeah, I mean, I'll eat it. When somebody comes back, <laughs> you, know I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about. When someone comes back, you know, like, okay, this is all right. And suffering has a way of turning us into chefs, if you will, in our serving, where we know how to get the seasoning right. It gives us this sort of distinction. There's a depth and a richness that can't be manufactured for everyone. Mass market. It's tailored. God is so good at making Chef Curry with the wrist out of some servants who are tailored to do their specific role unlike anyone else in the world. And suffering was a school that helped get them there. Again, it doesn't make suffering good. But there's something that God can bring from it that is. When you serve after suffering, God has a way of using how your hardship shaped you to bring in honesty, a candor, a legitimacy, a credibility, a healing. I've always loved 2 Corinthians 1 when Paul is encouraging the siblings in Corinth and he says that God is our comforter. Recently someone told me about uh, my comforter, my all in all, that there are people making videos snuggling up with their comforter. <laughs> Just think about how funny that is. But God is like that. He's uh, my comforter. <laughs> and he uses us and our affliction to bring comfort to others. That's a gift that God gives to the body. A uh, couple um, back in like October, we had a, a Thomas a sermon about Thomas and doubt and how Jesus used his scars to bring healing for Thomas. And then Thomas got to use his, the scars of his doubt to bring however many people legend only knows into the kingdom. And here in 2 Corinthians 1, it's the same thing, that the scars that you bear are to help someone. They tell a story. They are a testimony. It does not make them good, but our good God can bring good from anything. And it's the beauty of entrusting ourselves to him after our suffering, in our suffering and after it. He invites us to know him to know ourselves as he defines us and to join him in his character, in his mission, in his comforting us in our affliction. It's a gift. And I want to bring out one last aspect of this, and then I'm going to move to the, to the next point quickly. This book, in a lot of ways, is a, a polemic. Like it's a, I don't really know a synonym for polemic off the top of my head right now. It's just a, uh, uh, an argument, if you will, against other cultural understandings of God. Israel's neighbors had books like Job, but there are huge distinctions between them. Hear me. It sets Job aside as peculiar, as uniquely in encouraging, because these distinctions teach us how Israel understood God much differently from their neighbors, as if Job represents Israel and his friends represent Sumer or Egypt or Babylon. Their understandings of God are faulty. They fall short. They are wrong-headed. And Israel was supposed to be set against them. They were supposed to be faithful and endure and tell a better story, give a better revelation, show the world what God was like. There's so much to explore here. If you're a nerd like me, you can go way off the deep end. I'm trying to stay uh, in the pool before it goes, you know, this this the slide part where it goes down. Anyways, the slope. But here's a simple truth of why I say that. Job displays how God wants to use his people and his world. Job was tested by his suffering. He was proven faithful, and he rightly depicted God's character. He partnered with God by proclaiming truth and by welcoming those who have, having wronged God, they were still invited to, to be a part of what God was wanting to do, to be a part of his people. And that's what you see in verse 9 when Job prays for his friends. He offers the sacrifices. And we have received a very similar calling. 
God is inviting us to partner with him in this way. God wants us to be set apart, to be a picture of what God is like, to tell the story of what he's like, even amidst our suffering. Job was an example of that. He isn't the only example of that. We're going to see another one in a second, but I want to read this passage. I want to land the plane on Job and make one last quick brief point. Look at verse 10. It says, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. His family and his friends, they gather around him. They share a meal together. They even bring him like a starter pack so he can get back on his feet. Picks up in verse 12. And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. He had more cattle than he started with. He had more kids. He proves his character again. He transcends kind of like paternalism that was constant. And he gave his daughters an inheritance alongside of his sons. And speaking of inheritance, in the Old Testament, there's a theme that carries on where you would um, pass down the inheritance of idolatry to your kids and that it, the consequences of that would visit them to the third and fourth generation. I don't know if maybe you've, you're familiar with this, Exodus 34, I think it's in Exodus 20, it's in Deuteronomy 5, this idea of the third and the fourth generation. And here in the book of Job, wouldn't you know it? I would think, if I'm a Hebrew reader, I would think, you know, if Job's really innocent, then I'm going to see it in what his lineage inherits. And wouldn't you know, he sees, verse 16, and 17, and after this, Job lived 140 years, and he saw his sons, his sons, I'm sorry, he saw his sons and his sons' sons, four generations. Now, Hebrew, that's three for us, right? But Job is first. So you got Job's sons, sons, sons. Okay, anyways, so four generations. Job, uh, he saw the third and fourth generation. There's no judgment for them. There's no consequence for them. Job is innocent, he's exonerated, he's honored, he's even restored. Now, not just thinking about Hebrew readers, thinking about us. You might be wondering, now look, Ryan, we spent this whole summer on a premise, and I get to the end of the book, that premise is questionable. It's looking mad suspect. You told me that just because you're suffering doesn't mean that you're sinning. You told me that just because you're obedient doesn't mean that you get blessed. But here I see a mad, obedient dude getting blessed. What gives? Anybody, anybody ever felt a little bit of discrepancy with that when they read the book of Job? This is an honest place. There's space for you. Okay, good. That's good. I would say that it's natural, especially because we are us, post-enlightenment thinkers who often cannot get away from cause and effect. We're not ancient Near Eastern readers like they were. We'll get to that in moments. It is so natural that we would be thinking that. But I want to give a little bit of insight. Either way, I just hope this is an encouragement, okay? God restores. God redeems. That's who he is. It's what he does. That's just part of him. He gives. He blesses which is extremely good news, okay? It's something that we need to know and that we need to trust. If we didn't know that about him, it would be a little bit hard to know why we would want to be part of what he's got going on. Why would I want to know him? Why would I want to follow him? Why would I want to submit to him? But his goodness and his kindness are oftentimes displayed because he's good. But we also need to know that when hardship comes, it isn't always the result of some way we've been brought, uh, brought it upon ourselves. Or when blessing comes, it isn't somehow some uh, part of our obedience, okay? In the same way that we know those things from Job, we need to know that God restores. Uh, it needs to be said also that this restoration doesn't somehow like bring back the things that were lost, I doubt that Job is like, oh, I have new kids? Cool. Forget the old ones. Something tells me that's just not the way that humanity works. Right? It doesn't change what happened. So, he'll still walk with a limp, like we talked about. But here's, uh, here's what's hard about this, I think. We're cool with God restoring when it's us that he's restoring. 
it's kind of hard when we know that God is a restorer, but he's restoring somebody else. Dang, that one's tough, isn't it? It's a really difficult place to be. They got the healing. They got the new job, the relationship, the house. They carried to term. Why did they get restored? And I have the loss. That comparison can creep in real slyly. It's insidious. And it causes us to slip into that same cycle that we've been studying in Job and attempting to overcome. We struggle to remember that wisdom trusts God's wisdom all the time. It reminds me of a story, the end of uh, John's gospel, where Jesus tells Peter that he's going to die because of his ministry. Then he also tells Peter that John won't. Peter, like any of us, is curious why it has to be that way. And Jesus says to him, you need to run your own race. You have your calling that you need to walk in. Now, that doesn't necessarily translate very easily to suffering. Now, does it? When hardship comes, it's not like, well, God doled out more hardship to me. Guess I just need to pony up and keep it pushing. Doesn't necessarily feel that fun, does it? It's hard to remember that wisdom trusts God's wisdom all the time, especially in suffering. The truth remains the same. If God restores something for someone else and it isn't happening or doesn't happen for you, how do you reinforce your faith? How do you circumnavigate that cycle that sludges up your trust in Yahweh? How do you keep the engine running? The first two points were part of that. No God Know your identity. This third point, which we've been in, so I'm not just like about to get on a new point. This really brings it home. We move from info to intimacy by knowing the suffering servant. Know the suffering servant. Job called my servant. Pastor Jerry has discussed this before. I mentioned that there are other servants. Isaiah presented a few of them, these representatives that display God. One of them was Israel, but Israel was falling down on the job. So he talks about a a servant that is to come, a new one on the horizon that will perfectly encapsulate Yahweh, that will accomplish his purposes. However, he wouldn't really go about it in the way that you would expect. He doesn't establish some kingdom, set up a throne and rule. He suffers. And Job looked like him. Isaiah described it that after the suffering of his soul, he would see the light of life and be given a portion among the great and divide the spoils with the strong. Looks like Job's ending, doesn't it? Though it was the will of the Lord to crush him, to put him to grief, once his soul makes an offering for guilt, he'll see his offspring. He'll prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Do you see a a pattern in Job that looks... Similar, right? Job, humiliation, vindication, restoration. Here, we see the same pattern in the suffering servant. Humiliation, vindication, restoration. In 1 Peter 2, we see that Jesus is mocked. He's humiliated, but he doesn't react. He entrusted himself to God. In Philippians, Jesus was humble and exalted in the resurrection and later will be vindicated and further exalted when God brings an end to history and every knee bows, whether it's in worship or just acknowledgement, that Jesus really was who he said he was. And in 1 Peter 5, we're given a similar charge. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. When hardship happens, when you aren't restored, Will you know the suffering servant? Will you follow his pattern? Will you go after Jesus? Will you submit yourself to him and his way? Will you entrust yourself to God? Will you wait for him in time and in habit? Because again, we think about cause and effect. They were thinking more about order and disorder. The suffering is just a part of the disorder of this world that God has the power to bring into order. We think about it chronologically. They didn't. They wanted to know that God was able to bring order to the 
disorder of suffering, and we have those promises, it just takes a little bit more for us to really hold on to them and for them to settle in because we have to reframe our expectation. The alternative to that is that we attempt to insulate ourselves from suffering, that we do almost whatever we can to avoid hardship. And the greatest threat of that is missing Jesus. He didn't protect himself from suffering. He went toward it. He chose it, even. Out of love, out of mission, out of obedience, and on our behalf. Last thing. The band is going to make their way back up. You might be asking yourself this question. Okay, Ryan, what does it profit me to follow Jesus if it doesn't offer me protection from suffering? What benefit is there? That's one of the biggest themes in Job that we've studied. And hopefully with this last sermon, it lands. Then you put it in your pocket and you save it for later. Trusting God is worth it. It's worth it. Even if it doesn't really yield a huge payout. Righteousness is greater than revenue. Wisdom is worth more than wages. What is the benefit? The benefit is simple. You move from information about God to intimacy with God by knowing God, by knowing yourself, by knowing your identity, by knowing your calling, and by knowing the suffering servant. Now, this doesn't mean that we need to develop like a martyrdom complex, going out searching for suffering. All right, bring the hardship on so I can really know God. That would be foolish. However, I do hope that when hardship is knocking on your door, that you're prepared, that you're able to endure and to come out on the other side with information that's been internalized and led to intimacy. I hope you know God. I hope you know yourself. And I hope you know the suffering servant. At Disciple City Church, we do a time of contemplation where we just sit for a moment, we think, we follow it with singing, usually. And we're gonna do that now, a time of contemplation. We ask some questions. What is God calling us to start? What is God calling us to stop? What is God calling us to believe? And who is God calling us to share this with? So I'd urge you to sit now and sit again later if you need to answer these questions. Love you guys. the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. to the 
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. could all stand. know about you all, but um, I can't say that I haven't been shaken. And so I see this as more of a cry out to Jesus to hold me fast. And I'm depending on his strength to uh, keep me steady. It's not me saying I'm, I'm so determined and I'm so tough and my belief is so strong that I won't be shaken. It's Jesus. You are unshakable. So help me to build my life on you. course with me. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me.
so good. Come on up. Hey family, um, if I haven't met you yet, I'm Claire Howell. This is my husband, Preston. Um, we started the Creation Care Ministry about five years ago and I'm super excited today because we're actually launching recycling at our church building, which is something that's been on our hearts since the day we started. Yeah, it's super exciting. But just with all the building changes and everything with COVID and all that, we're just now getting it going. So one of the reasons we started Creation Care Ministry was to respond to God's invitation to us to partner with him in reconciling and restoring, as Ryan was saying, his creation. That includes us, that includes the butterflies, that includes the grass, it includes all of it. Um, and so in recycling, we get to do that. Um, we could talk a whole sermon on why to recycle, but we'll try to keep it quick. Uh, the mechanics of it. So recycling is ex surprisingly expensive, like over a grand a year for us as a church, um, and we can't afford that yet. So uh, we have bins in the back, split, uh, paper, glass, metal. Uh, if you have recycling, put it in there. If you see that a bin is full and you have recycling, take a bin, take it home, recycle it, bring the bin back. Uh, great way for us to save some money as a church and to be able to partner in the broader narrative. Uh, and if you have questions about why recycle or you're like, I've heard it's broken, we should just throw everything away, come and talk to us. We would love to have that conversation. Um, this is a great way for us to partner in caring for the earth uh, and we're excited to do it as a church. Come on. Also, if you already recycle and you're like, okay, I got this and I'm ready for the next step, come talk to one of us about composting. That's another option for you to steward the resources and the waste that you have. Um, in a huge way that actually saves us a ton of money and really builds up our garden. So it's like a win-win for everybody. Um, so if you're ready to take that next step and you wanna do that, let me know and I can connect you with the people to get started. So. Come on, y'all. Thank Thanks, you. you guys. Yeah, so good, so good. We all give it up for Creation Care, please. Creation care. We could uh, use that as an entire illustration for today. But they spoke about getting connected. If you're here and you want to learn more about Disciple City Church, Discover DCC is next week. If you're here and you want to join Disciple City Church, Discover DCC is next week. And this is the last one before we start a membership cycle. So Preston and the team are going to have, uh, you know, the next few weeks uh all of August into September for welcoming new members. So if you're a person who wants to consider joining Disciple City, I invite you, please, come to Discover DCC next week. Uh, it's right down the hall. It'll be at 930. Pastor Jerry usually teaches that. Still on sabbatical. Still pray for Pastor Jerry and his family, the Wagners, as they are on sabbatical, resting, being restored, so that they can continue to be great here in their serving. Uh, you can find out more information about that uh, on our website, disciplecitychurch.org. Also, if you're a member or not, but I think members mostly, you can get the Church Center app and you'll find everything there. Look, there's a calendar. You'll find Discover DCC and you can sign up from there. You'll also see that we have a revive coming up, a prayer night. Come on, two weeks, right? Are we excited? All right, okay. All right. You'll also see that we're going to have like a building anniversary party. We'll have coffee some breakfast tacos. You'll see that there's gonna be a women's ministry gathering this month. Uh, there's all types of things that you will find there. One of them is giving. Members, please continue to give. If you're a guest, no sweat. Don't sweat it, please don't give. But we would welcome you to come back to the Connect Center and get connected, learn more about who we are, what we do, those types of things. And uh, I'll just say, if you're looking for something hard, if you wanna press into the hard like we talked about in the sermon, uh, I would just tell you that um, maybe you could just consider maybe uh, just helping a guy put together a play set, you know what I'm saying, for his, for his kids. So I, it's going to be hot. We have AC and water and dinner. So if you l love two-year-olds, celebrate one. His name's Theo. He's really cute. Please consider helping me. All right. I love you. Uh, I'm going to bless you as you, as you go. Um, May the love of God, go ahead. Early bird ends next week. It ends on Sunday, right? Man, you got me beat, bro. I was going to do it next week and be like, last chance is today. But now you get an early bird to the early bird. Guys, you want money off 
of your registration for the marriage conference, you got a week, all right? It's cheap. If you want somebody to go to the marriage conference, invite them. It's cheaper now. Get, get registered. Secure your spot. All right, let me bless you on your way out. May the love of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit go with his people now and forevermore. Let all God's people say amen. amen. Hey, go hug somebody that don't look like you and then help them put it in the other place. Okay, I love you. Bye. your treasure home mansions made of men that touch the sky from earth but still your house of choice was broken vessels made of dirt so make my heart your home all that's mine is yours so make my heart your home My life is yours. Everybody, oh.